the Sega CD. Originally launched in Japan in late 1991, it would make its way west with a North American release in late 1992, and Europe and Brazil during the first half of 1993, where it was known as the Mega CD. There are two distinct mainline models of the Sega CD. The first is often referred to as the Model 1, and sat underneath of the Genesis, while the second release was designed to be cheaper, and sat beside it. Outside of these releases, there was also a standalone unit known as the Sega CDX, a portable design that had both the Genesis and Sega CD built together. This would be known as the Multimega in Europe, and the Multimega CDX in Brazil. Other companies would also get into releasing Sega CD hardware. We'd see Victor's Wonder Mega combo unit, which itself would see a few variations. There's 1992's RGM1, which was loaded with karaoke functionality and had built-in S-Video output. This unit originated at an astonishing 83,000 yen, a price that would be well over $700 by today's exchange rates. The RGM2 was released a year later and was a complete redesign. This unit was smaller, had infrared wireless controllers, and was much cheaper. The RGM2 would make its way to North America in 1994, though it would lose the wireless controllers, the S-Video port, and was renamed the JVC XI. There was a revision to this design released shortly after that removed the 9-pin AV port, breaking 32X compatibility in the process. In 1993, Pioneer would release the Laser Active LaserDisc player. This behemoth had the ability to be upgraded with add-on modules, one of which supported the Sega Genesis and Sega CD software. It also allowed the use of Mega LD software, or games that would play on the LaserDisc format. This thing was crazy expensive when it launched, going for nearly $1,000 for the base unit. The weird and wonderful versions of the Sega CD didn't stop at the Laser Active, and in 1994, Iowa would release the CSD G1M, or commonly referred to as the Iowa Mega CD. This strange design was actually a portable CD and radio player which had the ability to dock with a specially designed add-on that added Sega Mega Drive and Mega CD compatibility. It's rare as hell, was only released in Japan, and when one does pop up for sale, it often goes for crazy money. The hardware of the Sega CD was designed to complement the Genesis. It adds another, faster Motorola 68000 CPU to assist the one already in the Genesis. It also adds sprite and background scaling and rotation effects, something the Genesis could not do in hardware itself. The Sega CD also added additional sound channels, and of course CD quality music. When a Sega CD game put together all the elements of its hardware, it could be something truly special. When it comes to the library of the Sega CD, its diversity and quality is often overshadowed by the poor performance of its hardware sales. Many will say Sega didn't support the add-on, leading to lowered consumer confidence. I don't agree with this, as the Sega CD would see over 200 games released in just under 4 years on the market. The device had dozens of games that were worth owning, and many more that were the best versions of popular multi-platform games. No, its library was nowhere near the size of a standalone console, but its games were meant to complement the Genesis library, and covering games and features the Genesis simply wasn't capable of pulling off on its own. But Sega was to blame for the overall negative public perception of the Sega CD. In the West, the entire advertising campaign was based around full motion video games. While these games had an exciting appeal of being new, they were never accepted by the mainstream audience, and coupled with the incredibly high pricing of the hardware, simply wasn't enough to draw consumers in. Worse, the Sega CD's incredible sprite and background manipulation hardware was hardly ever used by Sega. Even when a game was released that should have shown off these features, it often never did. Digging a little deeper, another problem Sega had was the fact that many Genesis staples never made its way onto the Sega CD as unique releases. We'd see no dedicated Streets of Rage title, no exclusive Shinobi title. Hell, Sega never even brought over any of its Super Scalar arcade games for a port. Where was Outrunners, Galaxy Force 2, or Jurassic Park? These games would have stood heads and tails above the software that was offered by the Genesis and Super Nintendo visually. The library wasn't complete shit as some would have you believe, however. 
there were dozens of multi-platform games that were best on the Sega CD at the time. Everything from Mickey Mania, with its expanded soundtrack and voice work, to Final Fight in its two-player co-op and arcade faithful content, to Earthworm Jim Special Edition and its added level, weapon, animation, and absolutely incredible music, to Batman Returns and its technically breathtaking driving stages and movie quality soundtrack. Where the Sega CD truly shined was of course when a game was designed for it from the ground up. These games took the form of software that would either take advantage of the system's sprite and background hardware, or it would use the relatively huge storage size of the CD format to expand the experience well beyond a cartridge's capability. The RPG genre was well represented on the system. There are two Lunar games, Lunar the Silver Star and Lunar Eternal Blue. Both these games have excellent soundtracks, tons of voice work, great cinemas, and lengthy adventures to keep you busy. You couldn't play them anywhere else at the time, making their Sega CD appearance an awesome addition to the library. Adventure games would make a big splash on the Sega CD as well, and none more important than Konami's Snatcher. The brainchild of famed game designer Hideo Kojima, this here was loaded with voice work, adult themes, and set in 2047, a futuristic world where a new threat called Snatchers are killing people and assuming their identity. Often referred to as a graphic adventure game, this is the only version of Snatcher to see an official Western release for any system. There was nothing like it at the time, giving you a depth of story and adult themes well beyond anything else on the market. Not all full motion video games for the Sega CD were terrible. Road Avenger had a style and presentation you couldn't help but love, with you assuming the role of a widow hellbent on avenging the loss of his woman. It's driven by an excellent soundtrack, and was one of the better playing full motion video games at its release. I'd even go so far as to say, it's the best version of this game available. Dragon's Lair was brought home for the Sega CD, and was one of the very first times it was released fully featured on CD-ROM format. Even with the hit in color, it was still awesome to see the arcade original brought home. You also had Time Gal, a great looking game featuring time travel, with you chasing a criminal hellbent on changing the future. It was one of the better looking FMV games at the time, and did the arcade source material proud. While many of the full motion video games on the Sega CD received better looking versions elsewhere eventually, seeing these games run on a home console in the early 1990s was truly impressive. The shoot 'em up genre is actually rock solid on the Sega CD, with a number of games you can't play a physical version of anywhere else. KO Flying Squadron is a colorful shooter with great graphics and sound that really look like nothing else on the system. Even its cutesy presentation couldn't turn me off this great playing experience. While many other shoot 'em up fans were swinging for Musha's sack, I had enjoyed the hell out of the follow-up, Robo Alesta. Aliste, Aleste, whatever the hell you want to call it. Its incredible music drove solid gameplay across very well-designed stages and enemies. It doesn't get the credit it deserves, but was definitely a boon to the Sega CD library. You can't forget Silphied either, one of the most graphically impressive games on the system back then. It overlaid polygonal ships on full motion video backdrops, creating the illusion of some truly outstanding rendering. The soundtrack wasn't bad either. I also loved Android Assault, a great playing game, and another shoot 'em up that doesn't get the respect it deserves. Some developers wouldn't simply port over their cartridge releases to the Sega CD with a CD soundtrack instead opting to actually completely redesign their games. 1993's The Terminator was one such title, and the Sega CD version was a near complete overhaul, with new graphics, stage design, weapons, cinemas, music, and much more. This side-scrolling run and gun was another excellent addition to the library, and proof original software of existing IPs could coexist on both the Genesis and Sega CD successfully. Even Sega themselves was smart enough to realize that their new mascot shouldn't simply be dumped on their add-on with improved music, and in 1993 the Sega CD would get a completely original entry, Sonic CD. Adding in a new dash mechanic, new time traveling stages, and truly memorable music, this was my favorite 16-bit Sonic game by a mile. Each stage was crafted to be explored instead of just blasted through at top speed. In fact, 
you miss the entire point of the time traveling additions by not exploring the game fully. It also added bonus stages that used the Sega CD scaling tech, giving it a high class feeling above the 16-bit entries. Eternal Champions would receive a ton of content added to the original release to the point where it felt like a completely different game. Titled Challenge from the Dark Side, Sega would add new moves, characters, finishing moves, and even new Cinna kills, a brutally difficult kill where you would get to see your opponent meet his demise at the hands of his or her worst fear. It's a deep and underrated fighting game that the mainstream knows little about. Sega would also have the wherewithal to bring Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin to the Sega CD in 1993, a greatly enhanced port of their prior Genesis efforts. This one gets better stage design, improved graphics, and a much better selection of music. The ability to free roam the in-game map and choose your levels was an awesome change, and was yet another example of how simple little touches taking advantage of the Sega CD could add a ton to an existing experience. It may surprise some of you, but the Japanese Mega CD was the Sega CD's weakest market in terms of overall sales. Many games that were released in the West never saw a Japanese version, and strong Japanese exclusives were few and far between. I did enjoy its port of the Neo Geo classic Sengoku, however. Not being able to afford a Neo Geo back then, having access to this game at home was a huge win for me as a Sega CD owner. It of course wasn't perfect, but was solid enough to be more than just a curiosity. I also enjoyed Devastator, a mech platformer run and gun shoot 'em up hybrid that was fast and quite visually striking at times. It's based on the anime of the same name, and is one I definitely recommend if you have a Mega CD or the means to play import software on your Sega CD. When it came to the technically impressive stuff that used that hardware sprite scaling and rotation, no company made the Sega CD sing like Core Design. They started out with some tame software by porting stuff like Chuck Rock, but also had an early attempt at doing something different with the hardware in 1992's Jaguar XJ220. Not the most impressive game, but you could see they wanted to do more with the hardware. That would come with 1993's Thunderhawk a helicopter combat simulator using the Sega CD's hardware scaling for the entire presentation of the game. It was an excellent showpiece and a harbinger for things to come. In 1994, Core Design would again wow Sega CD owners with Soul Star, a shoot 'em up that would incorporate on rails and free roaming stage design. This is one of the Sega CD's most impressive technical showings and proves beyond a shadow of a doubt in my mind that if more games had looked and played like this, the Sega CD library would have sold a few more hardware units. Core Design would also show up strong with Battle Core, a mission-based free-roaming mech shooter. They again relied on heavy use of the Sega CD's specialized hardware for scaling sprites, which in turn created another unique looking and playing experience. Their final release for the Sega CD would land in 1994, with a spin-off from the Chuck Rock series, BC Racers. Using a similar graphic style as Super Mario Kart, this combat racer was exactly what software should have been for the Sega CD from the get-go. Natural extensions of existing properties that would use the specialized hardware in ways the base Genesis unit could never duplicate. All in all, Core Design's contributions to the Sega CD library are undeniably some of its most unique and playable experiences. If you haven't played these games, you're missing a huge piece of what Sega CD ownership was all about. Despite the success of the Genesis and Mega Drive platform, Sega CD would only see about 2 million units sold worldwide in its entire lifetime, and is often cited as Sega's first big misstep in the West. It gets lumped in with the 32X as an example of how and why Sega burned away all its consumer confidence. But is history's perception of the Sega CD a fair one? Or is it the result of so few people having actually owned and supported the system during its lifetime? Hindsight has a way of removing the original experience's strongest elements, often stripping away key points that could have only been experienced during the actual life of the device. I feel there is no doubt the Sega CD had its problems. The machine was expensive as hell in every region it was released in, especially Japan, where it retailed for over $500. Even when Sega brought it west, Genesis owners stared at $300 or more as the barrier to entry, which means that in modern terms, the Sega CD would have been hundreds of dollars more than even a PlayStation 4. 
even with a perfect library of games, this would have been nearly an insurmountable obstacle to overcome. Sega also poured nearly all of its marketing muscle behind full motion video games. While these captured the imagination of potential buyers in the first few months, magazine reviews and word of mouth quickly cut short this momentum, revealing these games to often be short-lived experiences that were all over the place in terms of quality. Despite the forward-facing and undeniable problems Sega faced with the Sega CD, I feel that the system was a great part of my 16-bit experience. It had a relatively large library of games available, some of which could easily be argued as must-owns. There is a popular narrative among the uninitiated that Sega didn't support it properly, which simply isn't true. Sega actually released a fair number of games for the Sega CD, and if Sega is to be accused of anything, it's simply that they didn't release the right kinds of games. I wanted to see the Sega CD do super scalar ports of Sega's popular arcade games, like Outrunners. I wanted to see the Sega CD do an exclusive side story to Streets of Rage. I would have killed for a shinobi that incorporated a Yuzo Koshiro CD soundtrack, and a full motion video background layer that showed distant storms and windswept trees basically enhanced stuff that had made the Genesis so popular to begin with. Even with all that said, I still consider the Sega CD to be an underappreciated device that had plenty of good games to come by. It's easy to fall in line with the narrative that it has nothing to play, but that song is often sung by those who didn't own it while it was available at retail. I encourage you to fire one up on the many emulators that play Sega CD software, and give the system a fair shake yourselves you may just find that it gives you a lot more than you ever thought possible. I'm Sega Lord X. thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.